I'm Alexa Mead, and I'm a painter. And this is one of my paintings. But this is not actually a painting of a man on canvas. This is a painting of a man directly on top of a man. What I do in my artwork is I skip the canvas altogether, and I paint directly on top of whatever it is I want to paint a picture of. I developed this process for painting in three-dimensional space that when you photograph it, it looks like a flat painting on canvas. However, I want you to know that there's no smoke and mirrors involved, there's no post-processing, photoshopping, or any special effects that happen after the fact. Everything happens in the way that I paint it. And really what I'm doing is I'm just painting reality on top of itself. So what you're looking at is the real object, the core of it, and it's covered in the artist's own reinterpretation directly on top of it. <laughs> yeah, it kind of tickles a little in the ears. <laughs> so, you know, when I first started this process, I didn't have this video to illustrate what was happening. And when I first started, I didn't have the vocabulary. I had no idea how to explain to people what was happening. So when I approached my first model, I said, all right, Bernie, I have this idea. It's really cool, and you should do it. And he just said, OK. So I'm painting him in my studio, and he's going along with it. He's so excited, and he keeps on interjecting, saying, you know, what's this going to look like? What's happening? And I say, trust me, it's going to happen. And he said, well, I, I know, I trust you, but why is there a paintbrush up my nose? And I said, Bernie, this is why. I took photos on my camera, and I was so excited. I showed them to him, and he looked at them and just went, so what? You, you created a painting, and they just painted me to look like something? I said, no, no, trust me. Go to the bathroom, take your cell phone camera. He took a picture in the mirror, and all of a sudden, I heard screaming, shrieking coming from the bathroom. He couldn't believe his own eyes. Even though he was the artwork himself, and he'd gone through this whole process, he still could not believe his cell phone camera. So after I painted Bernie, I realized I was onto something. I did, a lot of I did a lot of practice, and I wanted things that would sit still for a little longer than him. He got a little squeamish with, you know, paint in the ears and everything. So I started painting on fruit, eggs, whatever I could get to sit for me for an extended period of time. And it was, it was fun. I learned a lot. Like, how much paint does it take to fill up a piece of toast? I didn't realize that toast would just be a giant sponge for paint. And then when it came to painting on the grapefruit, by the time I'd finished painting one section, all the paint would have dissolved from the acid and the citrus. I'd have to put more and more on. So that's why there's this kind of Van Gogh effect there. So after I started painting on all these Roots. I tried getting models. No one was really interested. They didn't understand what the heck was going on. So I decided to paint the only model who was willing to really sit, and that was myself. So I decided for this piece, it was one of my early ones, that I wanted to create one painting in three-dimensional space. I'd paint on myself, but then I'd create 500 images in all different poses. So I painted myself, and I want to let you know it's really hard to paint the back of your neck. I had to kind of take a picture from the side and look at the picture and paint, and I worked it out. So after I did the painting, I posed as many ways as I could. And I went and I told my friend, all right, this is one painting, 500 ways. She flipped through the photos and went, so you created 500 paintings and made 500 photos of them? And it just wasn't clicking. So I decided it was time to do something a little more drastic. I painted a man, and I took him in the DC subway. <laughs> and everyone in the subway was just going, what the hell is going on here? It was finally clicking. People were having to confront it head on and see this man covered in paint walking through this space. And I was excited. I thought, OK, great. Now you know, I can show people. I'll communicate that there's something going on here. I took this image, and I put it in an art gallery. And I was expecting people to go, wow, she painted a man. Put him on the subway. Instead, I got people walking by, oh, huh. yeah, that's a nice piece of artwork. And I think most artists would be a little disappointed if that's what happened when people walked by their work. But I kind of got a kick out of it, because no one stopped and went, what the hell is going on? Because it was so far outside of that range that they didn't even think to question what the hell was going on. But I was shocked, because there was this one person who really got it. She walked straight up to the canvas, and she told her parents, mom, look, it's a painted man on the subway. And they looked down at her and just went, honey, art is very complicated. Don't worry, you'll, you'll get it someday. It, it'll click. And you know, it was this little girl who had so much more wisdom when it came to this than her parents. And I realized that maybe it was because she didn't have 10 or 20 or 50 or 70 years of looking at artwork. She didn't have this bias of what to expect when she looked at the picture. She was a completely blank slate and could actually see what it was right in front of her. 
And you know, a lot of people tell me, you know, Alexa, it's too bad you didn't go to art school, because maybe you'd be an even better painter, a better photographer. And I think, well, maybe it's because I didn't learn that there was a specific sequence of events that happens when you paint, that I was able to approach this with fresh eyes, like that five-year-old girl. I could come at this kind of sideways. And to tell the truth, my main inspiration from this, for this project didn't come from other artwork. It came from my past in politics. I spent my high school years and college years interning on Capitol Hill. 08, I worked for Obama in Colorado doing political communications. And I became absolutely fascinated with political spin. How you can take this one core piece of information and then twist it so many different ways just with these slight cosmetic tweaks on the surface. And so I thought, of, well, how can I take something and just put a thin layer of reinterpretation on top of it that drastically alters the way that we perceive information? So when I graduated from college, I decided this was what I was going to do full time. This was at my first art show. There were a total of 12 people there, and that includes me, my model, my two parents. <laughs> and it was the greatest victory for me. I was so excited. People were seeing what I was doing, and I was really believing in myself. Most of my friends did not believe in me. They thought it was absolutely crazy. They were trying to get me jobs on the Hill, trying to get me to work in the Obama administration, but I just wanted to fa follow my passion and make artwork. Well, my friends' opinions of me all changed, actually, on it, uh, what was it? March 10th. One of my friends sent me a Facebook message. She said, hey, your work's on kaki.org. And I responded back, cool, what's a kaki? I had no idea. I just Googled myself. I saw there was a picture of my art, one sentence in my name. And I was like, wow, I'm on the internet. Who knew? And I just kind of forgot about it. Well, I forgot about it for 45 minutes until all of a sudden phone calls started pouring in, emails. Everyone wanted to know what the hell I was doing with this project. How could I turn this person into a painting? Um, phone calls after phone calls. I got one phone call at 5 AM. I picked up the phone. I was like, what? I, some guy in this British accent, it was completely unintelligible. And it's just like, you know, I call, call back later. I hang up. He calls right back a second later. And I'm like, oh shit, I just hung up on CNN. And it's just this total whirlwind. It was crazy. All sorts of amazing offers came my way. My favorite, conference in Monterey. But <laughs> <laughs> another cool one actually was at the Saatchi Gallery in London. This show actually happened 51 weeks after my first show in Baltimore. And this time I had you know, some of the same people in attendance. I was there, my model, my two parents, and then 3,000 other people. And it was the largest show opening in Saatchi Gallery history for this group show, and it was absolutely incredible. I would have never dreamed that I would be at the Saatchi Gallery, and I would have never dreamed that I would be there for painting, especially because it turns out, when I was 16 years old, I said that I would never paint again. I made a lot of art growing up as a kid, and when I was 16, I became obsessed with painting. I just couldn't stop. And I was working on this self-portrait, and I got overly um, perfectionistic with it. I had to get it right. I'd think I'd be done. I'd notice one tiny little flaw. I'd go back in and completely rework the entire thing, wipe it out, and just kept on starting over and over. And this perfectionism turned into obsession, and just all of a sudden, it wasn't fun anymore. And I realized that this was not what the place I wanted art to be in my life. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to put down my brushes. This is not good for me right now. And I started doing sculpture and exploring space and got really excited by a bunch of other projects I was doing. And then six years after I put down my brushes, I had this amazing idea for this current body of work I'm doing now. But I realized I'd have to get back into painting to do it. It was really hard for me because I had all these negative associations with painting. I didn't want to go near it. So when I started this project, I told myself, well, it has to do with space, so it's installation. Or there's a person involved, so it's performance. Or I take pictures, so it's photography. It was anything but painting. And the way that I was able to also just get back to this was I told myself that I wouldn't do any sketches on canvas. I would do everything completely different than before. So I'd create my compositions in three-dimensional space, and I'd look at it, and that was how I made up my mind about what it would look like. And the other thing, too, is that before with painting, on canvas, I could never leave it alone. It was never finished. And I m made a goal that any time I painted on something, it would be something living, whether it was a person or it was organic food that would eventually rot. So there was this constraint of time. It's not like I can paint on a person and then say, great job today, see you tomorrow, because once they shower, it's done. And frequently what will happen is I'll be painting along, be going great, the person will go, Alexa, I kind of need to go to the bathroom. 
And we're like, all right, okay, almost done. And just hurry up and be done. And it's so liberating because once I snap that photo, it's over. I can't go back in and touch it up or say, oh, I wish I did that differently. Because that's part of where the beauty lies, is in just having it being that, capturing that moment in time. And the funny thing is that now through this process, I'm actually able to reapproach the self-portrait. I can paint it and be content with it and be done. And it's because I allowed myself to kind of deprogram the way that I saw painting, to look at it through the eyes of that five-year-old girl who didn't have these associations with it, that I was able to kind of reconceptualize what I thought of as painting and how do we create a picture. And that's why today I was actually confident to come up here and describe myself in the first few words as a painter. And you know, today, actually, I'm going to recreate one of my paintings for you. <laughs> 